Hello lovely viewers and welcome to Learning with JGO. Today in this video, we are going to discuss and analyze The Good Morrow by John Doan. Before we proceed, consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so that you are notified anytime a new video is uploaded. That being said, let's tap right into today's lesson. The Good Morrow is an amazing romantic poem written by John Doan of course during the post-Shakespearean era. The poem, like most of John Doan's other poems, is a metaphysical poem. By metaphysical poems, I mean poems that employ the use of extended metaphors, or if you like, very wild comparisons in making reasonable points. The imaginative contrast of things are usually referred to as conceit. Conceit is a fundamental element of most metaphysical poems, and John Doan is a master of his usage. This poem is replete with conceits as the poet compares and alludes the nature of his love to his lover to many things including the seven sleepers, the planets, the sun, the signs of humors, and others. The poet makes wild and exaggerated comparisons of love and argues his way out to prove his point. This makes the poem a metaphysical poem. I am going to read through the poem so that we try to appreciate it after which we can begin the summary and stanza-by-stanza stanza analysis of the poem. The Good Morrow by John Doan I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we laughed. Were we not weaned till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly, or snorted we in the seven sleepers then? T'was so, but this all pleasures fancies be, if ever any beauty I did see, which I desired and got, so was but a dream of thee. And now good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear, for love all love of other sides controls, and makes one little room and everywhere. Let's see discoveries to new walls have gone. Let maps to other walls on walls have shown. Let us possess one world, each hath one, and is one. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears, and true plain hearts, doing the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres? Without sharp north, without declining west. Whatever dies was not missed equally. If our two loves be one, or thou and I love so alike, that none do slacken, none can die. This is the good morrow. The good morrow is a love poem set in the morning. Generally, the poem centers on the transition from a childish form of love love in its physical sense, or maybe last I should say, to a more true, organic, and spiritual form of love. The poem begins with the persona asking his lover what at all they were doing before they loved each other. He asks whether they were not weaned before they met. He asks again whether or not their love lives were based on mere country pleasures. Were they not asleep like the seven sleepers in the cave till this day? He continues to ask, but yes, it was so, he answers. All that they experienced prior to this day were mere fancies, nothing serious. The persona continues by saying that if ever he came across any form of beauty in this world, such beauty was just a part or segment of the beauty he sees in his lover now. But good morning to the awakened souls, as they will now watch each other without fear, as he is introduced to a new form of love. To him, Everything he needs in life is found in the little room he is in with his lover. Sea discoveries can go hunting for new worlds. Maps can be made to show the ecstasy in discovery. He does not care. He and his lover will possess one world and together they will be one. In their eyes appears each other's faces and on their hearts do these faces rest. The persona asks where can two better hemispheres be found without a sharp north and without a declining west. He says that whatever that was not mixed equally will surely die. But then their love, if sincerely, is true, and they both claim to love each other as much as they do, then they will be immortal. That's the summary of the poem. The Good Morrow is a beautiful love poem, not because of the romantic intent the poet tends to convey, but also the intellect with which he uses to display his worldview of love to his lover. Examine the poem critically, you observe that in appreciating his lover, John Doan makes use of religion, astronomy, 
medical science, geography, and even biology in trying to eternalize his love to his lover. The poem has just three stanzas with seven lines, making a total of 21 lines, and is brilliant of John Donne also of how intricately he weaves this poem into producing the rhyme scheme that is got. A B A B C C C. This rhyme scheme sets a general tone of regularity throughout the poem, indicating the poet's relentless appraisal of his lover's beauty. Now I want us to do the stanza by stanza analysis of the poem. I will read through the poem once more and then we begin our analysis. I wonder by my trough what thou and I did till we loved, were we not win till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly, or snorted we in the seven sleepers then. Twas so, but this all pleasures fancies be, if ever any beauty I did see, which I desired and got, twas but a dream of thee. The poet begins the first stanza by asking four questions. In the first line, he asks, I wonder by my troth what thou and I did so we loved. The poet is asking, and sincerely, what at all he and his lover did before they met. Troth here is a colloquial term for the word truth. In other words, troth is used by the poet to symbolize the pledge of faithfulness and loyalty during the exchange of vows in a marriage ceremony. The honesty that comes with the taking of vows is what is embedded in the poet's use of the word troth. So the poet wonders with all honesty and sincerity what meaningful thing at all he did with his life before meeting his lover. Were we not win till then? The poet asks. He is asking his lover whether they weren't adults before they met. Were we not weaned? Weaning is a term usually associated with taking babies off their mother's breast milk and introducing them to real food. Of course, you don't wean babies into adults. You wean babies into children. But then you realize that the poet uses the term wean in the context of adults to ask his lover, were we just children? Were we not adults before we met? Because clearly to the poet, everything they did was childish. And that is represented in the next line, but sucked on country pleasures childishly. It surprises the persona that he and his lover were indeed adults before they met. His encounter with his lover made him ponder a lot on the crazy stuff that he did before. He labels them as country pleasures. There's something fascinating about this line, the weight of words that it carries, but sucked on country pleasures. Sucked in this line gives us the impression of a baby who is still breastfeeding, an attempt by the poet to still describe their experiences before loving each other as childish. Then comes the freeze country pleasures. Now this phrase carries so much weight because metaphorically, country pleasures in this line connotes the physical aspect of their sex lives before they met. It connotes the vibrance they had and enjoyed, how sexually active and aware they were, and the simple, unsophisticated and immature sexual pleasures they had before finding each other. It will interest you to know that the poet is actually playing with the words country pleasures, a term in literature we refer to as pan the play of words. By the use of the word country, the poet is actually referring to the term cunt, a colloquial term for the female genitals. So that instead of the inappropriate use of the word cunt, he says country and that's just fine. Or snorted we in the seven sleepers then? The poet continues to ask. This question is still an inquiry into their perceived childish state before they met. The use of the terms noted and then produces animalistic images. That indeed, their lives were lived as though they were animals, living carefree and unsophisticated lives. Seven Sleepers is an allusion to a Roman Catholic story in which seven children, in order to avoid persecution, hid themselves in a cave for hundreds of years. After centuries of sleep, they are finally awoken to a new world. That's the allusion in which he compares their lives that is the persona and his lover, to that of the seven sleepers who would have been awoken to a new world just like him and his lover have after getting to know each other. To us so, the persona answers himself. You get the impression that he was actually asking rhetorical questions which need no answers from anyone. But this, all pleasures fancies be. But all these pleasures we had were mere fancies. 
The pleasures were nice, yes, but not very significant and did not carry any weight at all to bring the persona so alive as he is at the moment looking at his lover. So if ever any beauty I did see, which I desired and got, it was but a dream of thee. The poet concludes the final lines of the first stanza by telling his lover that if ever he came across anything beautiful in this world, anything beautiful which he desired and got, it was just a reflection of the beauty of his lover. In other words, the fulfillment that the persona had in acquiring certain beautiful things in the world forms a minute stick in what he's feeling now with his lover. The last two lines are loose in a way to Plato's allegory of the cave, which states that in a cave, you only see a reflection of objects under the sun on the floor or the walls of the cave, but not the actual object itself. In a similar vein, to the poet, all the other beauties which he got were mere reflections of what he has now. His current lover is the real deal. And now good morrow to awaken souls, which watch not one another out of fear, for love or love of other sides controls and makes one little room and everywhere. Let's see discoveries to new worlds have gone. Let maps to other worlds on walls have shown. Let us possess one world, each hath one and is one. The second stanza introduces us to the aftermath of the poet's realization of his love to his lover. He says, good morrow. Good morrow, meaning good morning. So good morning to awakened souls. There are different ways of interpreting this line. The first and literal way of understanding this line has to do with the poet's appreciation of his lover's beauty after they woke up. This line gives the impression that the persona might have spent the whole night with his lover making enough discovery about her, probably in terms of her beauty, in order to praise her in the morning. Another way of seeing this same line, and now good morrow to our waking souls, is by observing it from the emotional and spiritual point of view. We had the understanding in the first hands that a lot of the pleasures the persona and his lover had were mere fancies. They were country pleasures. Pleasures that were sought from the physical body, either by looking or by touching. Still in stanza 1, the persona compares their lifestyles in the frame of love as childish. They were blind to the emotional and more captivating aspect of love. In stanza 2, however, they are walking to a new reality of love, not physical, but emotional. We can also understand this line from a religious perspective, specifically from the Christian faith. Not only does this line connote a result of the poet's sleep in the seven sleepers den, it also alludes to the Christian understanding of the term light. Light in terms of enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, being introduced to something new and promising in the Christian faith. The poet compares his experiences of waking up with his lover to the experience of a believer who is enlightened by some deeper aspect of his religious faith. From the sun comes light, a symbol of sunrise, and the awakening of souls from sleep. Which watch not one another out of fear. The poet continues that with the new reality that they've awoken to, they should not look at each other out of fear like they used to. Previously, when they both lived lives of fancy and enjoyed country pleasures, they did so with fear. Fear of a possible heartbreak. Fear of maybe nature taking its turn on either of their lives. But now, he tells his lover not to be afraid. For love or love of other sides controls. In this line, the poet is trying to establish one thing. He is in love, and as one who is blinded and controlled by love, he sees things differently from other people. Because of the way he sees love, it makes one little room and everywhere. The poet sees everything and everywhere in the room with his lover. Comparing a little room containing himself and his lover to everywhere suggests that he does not care about anything outside his room as everything he needs can be found in that little room where he sees his lover. Let's see discoveries to new worlds have gone. Let maps to other worlds on worlds have shown. These lines obviously allude to the periods of exploration and discovery by the West. An exciting period that saw most people travel the world to explore and colonize lands at distant places. So the poet says, he does not care if everyone became sea discoverers, traveling and conquering lands. 
He certainly does not care if cartographers show him maps of the known world, that is, maps of the discovered places. There was in fact no greater honor and privilege than being a part of a crew of voyage that explored the world and made discoveries during the poet's useful life. But the poet resists the temptation of the world in favor of a commitment to his lover. He prefers to be in one little room with his lover, a room in which he finds everything he needs than go anywhere else. Let us possess one world, each hath one, and is one. This line basically talks about the concept of one plus one equals one in the language of love or marriage. This same line is a biblical allusion. Genesis 2 verse 24, which says that, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave into his wife, and they shall be one flesh. You heard that right, one flesh. Each hath one, and is one. The idea of the poet possessing one world with his partner is a mark or an expression of commitment to his lover. The unifying force that brings them together makes them one. It makes them whole. It makes them complete. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears, and true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres, with our sharp north, with our declining west? Whatever dies was not missed equally. If our two loves be one, or thou and I love so alike, that none do slacken, none can die. So in the third stanza, the poet says, he sees his face in his lover's eyes, and she as well sees hers in his eyes. This line is a reiteration of the love they have for each other, a reciprocal love, love that is mutual, not a one-sided one. And true plain hearts, during the face's rest, the poet is basically trying to say that he loves his lover dearly. The mention of faces resting on plain hearts gives the impression of the love, the beauty, the compassion, and other lovely qualities which find their ways into the hearts of the lovers. Where can we find two better hemispheres, without sharp north, without declining west? Where can we find two better hemispheres? The poet employs conceit here. He is making a comparison of the eyes to hemispheres of a planet or a star. Obviously, planets have nothing to do with love, but with the poet's comparison of an eye to a planet, you get a feeling of where the poet is driving at. He talks about two hemispheres. It could be the north, it could be the south, or the east, or the west. The poet makes mention of how the hemispheres of his eyes and that of his lovers are better than that of the planets. From this particular line, you get the impression that the lovers possess one eye, seeing the world through love, and each complementing the other with better hemispheres. Hemispheres without sharp north, nor declining west. In the next line, the poet is trying to give out reasons why the hemispheres of his eyes and that of his lovers are better than the hemispheres of the planets. He finds fault with the hemispheres of the planets, saying that they have a sharp north. Sharp indicating some sort of coldness many planets possess at the extreme north that does not make it possible for the growth or survival of most living things. A declining west is another fault the poet finds with the hemispheres of the planets. Unlike the love that exists between him and his lover that has just begun to grow, planets have a declining west. Declining west to mean the planets each each and every day and die. Sunset is a symbol of death, a symbol of weakness, and the hemisphere of planets possess that quality. The hemispheres of the lovers, however, is perfect, and the poet wonders where better hemispheres can be found. Whatever dies was not missed equally. This line is an allusion to the medical science of the humors. During the poet's time, death was believed to be caused by the imbalance of the four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. That was the medical knowledge at the time. The poet amazingly compares his love for his lover to the notion of the humors, that unlike the imbalance of the humors that causes sicknesses in people and then eventually death, the love he possesses with his lover is balanced, it is perfect, it is mixed equally and so will only grow and will not die. If our two loves be one, or thou and I love so alike, that none do slacken, none can die. Now in the last two lines, 
the poet tries to eternalize his love to his lover. He begins the last but one line with a condition if. This in a way implies that despite all the praises and admiration the poet has shown to his lover, he does not know the response of his lover to these intellectual love tactics that he employs on her. In effect, what the poet means in the last two lines is that if indeed his lover loves him as much as he does, then none can die, meaning their love will last forever, they will be immortal.